you'll open your Bibles this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I recently did a, officiated a funeral for a friend's mother. And five years earlier, I, I did his father's funeral. And not that funeral in particular, but at funerals, you hear a, wrong, a lot of wrong-headed thinking. You hear people sometimes say, well, you know, there are now an angel in heaven. Well, you know, that's absolutely wrong, and it's absolutely untrue. When a person dies, they don't become an angel. And yet, we hear that kind of thing quite, quite often. And what we need is to be biblically minded and think wisely and rightly about things associated with, with death. The letter that which, to which Paul wrote here in 1 Thessalonians, as we've talked about before, was written to relatively young Christians. And this relatively young group of Christians had some family members and friends that had died. And they had no idea what happens to people when they die. Just like we have wrong-headed thinking about death and the afterlife in our own day, they had wrong-headed thinking in their own day. If you were to walk through an ancient cemetery, you would see the inscriptions on the tombstones often to read something very much like this. I was born, I lived, I died, I don't care. Sometimes the last line would be, I don't exist. And that was the, the thinking that permeated the ancient world, that you lived, you died, and you cease to exist. It's not really that, that much more wrong than it is to think that when somebody dies, they become an angel. They're both wrong-headed thinking. They both have absolutely nothing to do with what the Bible says. But Paul was concerned about his young converts in Thessalonica, some of them had lost family members that were new Christians, uh, probably parents or grandparents or a spouse or a sibling. They're all very young Christians. Paul's discipled them only for a relatively brief period of time. And so it's, it's no wonder that he had not had opportunity yet to teach them about death, what happens to people when they, when they die. And so Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, to give them hope. And those believers that were grieving and in anguish over the loss of a loved one, he wrote to give them hope. Let me, let me begin reading in verse 13, and then I want to talk with you today about the day death dies. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the arch archangel and with the trumpets of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so Paul is writing to grieving Christians in Thessalonica. They're young Christians. They're, they're immature in their faith because they have, they've not been believers for very long. And he's wanting to encourage them and to instruct them and to inform them about how they are to handle grief and the loss of a loved one. So notice he says in verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. You know, ignorance is not bliss. It's not helpful just to believe a lie. That is, we want to be people that believe the truth. That's why we need sermons that teach. And while it's appropriate to read books that are, that are lighthearted and, and, and novels that are, that are mysteries and such, there needs to be a place in our reading program where we read books of substance. 
so that, so that our minds don't become flabby and weak and, and easily led astray. We need sermons that teach, and we need to read books of substance. We need to make sure that we regularly read the Bible. That's where we need to draw our theology from. We don't want our theology to be, to be inculcated in us by the atmosphere in which we live where people believe that dead ones become angels or right is wrong and wrong is right. And so Paul says, we want you to be informed. We want you to understand, brethren, about those who are asleep. He refers to the Christian dead as those who are asleep. Now, he's not talking about some kind of soul sleep, that when a person dies, they, it's as if they're in a, in, a, in a spiritual coma or in a prolonged state of sleep. He talks about them being asleep because a corpse looks like it's asleep. But Paul would want us to understand that when a believer dies, they are very much alive. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you look at other places in the Bible, they're fully cognizant, they're fully aware of where they are and who they are and the Savior that saved them. And so when he says asleep, we don't want to misunderstand what Paul is saying. So he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, about those who are dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So there's two kinds of grieving. First, there's the grieving that is saturated in hopelessness. It's the, it's the grieving where we just make things up because it makes us feel better, like my loved one is now an angel. No, those who grieve with no hope, there's a period at the end of that life. And in the hopelessness of that grief, there's an anguish that is almost insurmountable. So people will find, try to find all kinds of ways to pacify that grieving. Sometimes they'll turn to alcohol or to illicit drugs or to, or to multiple relationships. They'll find anything to try to fill the void and try, to, and try to soothe the pain of separation from a child or a spouse or a parent or a friend. That, that hopelessness is overwhelming. It's like a chasm. It's like the Grand Canyon where, there, where there's just this echo. And when there's no echo, there's just utter silence. But that's not the way that a Christian grieves. Although sometimes we might think that Christians shouldn't grieve. That's a misnomer. That's a misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches. Absolutely Christians grieve. They they grieve deeply because they love deeply. But notice that they don't grieve as those who have no hope. It doesn't mean that they don't cry. It doesn't mean that they don't, they don't have a time of anguish and heartache and disappointment and pain. And sometimes that can go on for a, a lengthy period of time. But they don't grieve as those who have no hope because when they collapse on their bedroom floor in tears, they know, I am indwelt by the Spirit of God. I have a Father in heaven who knows what it's like to watch His Son die. I've got a church family that prays for me and cares for me, and and I'm just a phone call away from being able to call someone and say, I really need your prayers, I really need your help, and they'll be there for me, they'll pray for me, they'll come to my home and sit with me. And so it's not that Christians don't grieve, they don't grieve like people who have no who have no hope. When my, when my dad died, I grieved as one who had no hope. I, I, had, I did not know where to turn. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it. When my mom died a, a few years ago, I, I think I cried harder in the moments immediately preceding her death than any time in my entire life. In fact, I think if you were to describe it, you would describe it almost like a, a wailing. I was, I was so overcome with grief. 
And yet it wasn't but a moment and one of my boys had his arms wrapped around me and prayed for me and Jay Lynn was there with me and my my kids were calling on the phone and Dr. Eliff was uh, on the phone talking. And so it it was grieving, but not the grief of a lonely person, but the grieving of a person that was surrounded by a community of faith. He wants them to understand When you lose someone you love, the Christian grieving isn't stoicism. It's not not just taking a stiff upper lip and gritting your teeth and plowing through it. There's nothing godly about that. Well, what separates whether a person will be grieving with hope or grieving in hopelessness? Well, look with me in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Notice he says, for if we believe, if we believe the gospel, if we believe that Jesus Christ died for the sins of his people, was raised on the third day, is seated at God's right hand, is interceding for us even as we grieve, well, we're grieving with hope. We have the hope of the gospel. We have the hope that this life is not all that there is. When I was getting ready to speak at this funeral just a few weeks ago, and I was thinking about my friend as he was eulogizing his mother, and I was looking around at the family that were gathered there, I was reminded that this isn't the end of the road. It it is a reminder that this life is not heaven, that we live in a fallen world, that in a fallen world there's heartache, sin, pain, death, tragedy because of the sinfulness of this world. But if we believe the gospel, that's what he's talking about here, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, I don't mean we just give intellectual assent to it. I mean we actually embrace it wholeheartedly and we base our entire life on the fact that Jesus Christ died for sinners. He was brought back to life by God the Father. He ascended to heaven. He's seated at the Father's right hand. He is coming again one day. If that infuses our lives, then we, will, then we believe that He will bring with Him. That is, when He returns, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That means they're alive and they're with Him. If He's going to bring them with Him, They are alive. Now, their bodies have decomposed in the ground. One day when I I die, my body will be put into a casket. It will be lowered in the ground, and my my, uh, flesh will decompose. But I will be very much alive. I will be consciously, fully, completely alive, maybe more alive than at any point in my entire life in the presence of the Lord Jesus, but I won't have a body at that time. I will be a spirit without a body. But God created us to have a body, so there's coming a day when that decomposed corpse will be raised from the dead and reunited with our spirit. That's what he's going to say to them in just a moment. So notice, they can't come with him if they don't exist, but they do exist. Those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So he says in verse 15, for this reason we say to you by the word of the Lord. He's speaking on divine authority, speaking out of divine revelation. What he's saying to us comes directly from the Lord himself. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. See, he's writing to a people that are grieving over their loved ones, and they don't know what's happened to their loved ones. They don't know what's going to happen when Jesus returns to their loved ones. If Jesus were to return in their lifetime, what would happen to their loved ones? But notice he says, those who are alive when Jesus returns will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That is, they don't have a, they don't have a foot up even on those who, are al- those who are alive, don't have a foot up on those who have died in Jesus. He says, we say this by the word of the Lord. If we're alive and remain when Jesus comes, we don't have an advantage on those who have died in Jesus and are no longer with us. 
So he's going to begin to describe now what's going to happen when Jesus returns. He's not going to tell us everything we would like to know. And there's so many things that he doesn't say here that I, I have questions about, and some of them are answered in other places of the Bible, but we're looking right here as to what he said to the Thessalonians, and what he said to the Thessalonians is enough to give hope to those who grieve. Jesus is coming again. That's what he says. We see the Lord's return in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The Lord Jesus will descend publicly. He'll be accompanied by angelic beings. He, he's going to make a shout. There's going to be trumpets playing. What will he shout? What will Jesus say as he descends? Well, Paul doesn't tell us here, but John tells us in chapter 5. Listen to John 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now, Paul doesn't tell us about a resurrection to judgment here. He's, he's writing to believers. He's telling them about their Christian loved ones who have died What's going to happen to them? But what John is saying is there's going, to be a, there's going to be two resurrections that are taking place. Because non-Christian people die, their bodies put in the ground, their body decomposes just like a Christian person that dies. But they exist just as much as Christian people exist. They are a spirit without a body. They're awaiting eternal judgment. They're awaiting eternal punishment in hell. So those who trusted in Christ, the resurrection to life eternal, new heaven, new earth, those who did not know Jesus to a resurrection of judgment. Which of those resurrections will you be a part of? It's one thing to say, I hope I'm a part of the resurrection to life, but I tell you what, I wouldn't base my eternity on something like as flimsy as that. He told us what we should believe. We've got to believe the gospel. We've got to believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for my sins. He was raised on the third day, and he sits at God's right hand. There's got to be substance to our hope. There's got to be substance to our beliefs. That's why trite answers at funerals aren't very helpful, and sometimes they're just erroneous and wrong. We need to know which resurrection we will be a part of. That is, maybe Jesus will return in my lifetime. I'm not a prophet or, nor a, uh, the son of a prophet. I don't, I don't think he will. I think I will die before Jesus returns. And that my body will decompose in the ground, but I will be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. And on that great day when the Lord Jesus descends and he calls forth those who have died to a resurrection of life and to a resurrection of judgment, I am absolutely, completely confident I will be raised to a resurrection of life. That my spirit, which will be alive in the presence of God, fully cognizant, fully aware, completely conscious of everything that's going on in, uh, in heaven in God's presence will be reunited with my body. Why do I believe that? Because I've committed my life to it. I've committed my life to believing in the gospel. Not because I'm a preacher or a seminary professor or because I might be a good husband or a, a faithful father. No, because I have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only confidence I have that I will be raised to, uh, to life. So first, there's the Lord's return. Uh, second, notice he says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise first. How interesting that is. 
You see, they're worried that their loved ones are going to be left behind. He says the dead in Christ will be, ri- will be raised first. The dead in Christ will rise first. They're not going to get second place. They're going to rise first. So we see first the return of King Jesus, second the resurrection of the dead. That is, in the resurrection of the dead, our decomposed corpse will become a glorified body, and our spirit and our glorified body will be joined together. You say, that is phenomenal. How could you believe something like that? Because the Bible teaches it. How could God possibly do that? Maybe you had a loved one that was burned in a fire or died at sea. If Jesus Christ can speak into existence all of the universes that exist, He can resurrect a dead body. If Jesus Christ can keep all of the planets in orbit spinning, sending rain at the right time and winter at another time, if He can do all of that while keeping all of the various universes going, He can raise our dead bodies from the ground and we be clothed in a glorified body. Uh, He talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to what Paul writes there. He says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So if we are alive when Jesus returns, we will be instantaneously changed into our glorified body. And if we are dead when Jesus returns, our dead body will be reunited with our spirit, and we will be in an eternal state in the presence of God among the people of God forever and ever. So first, there's the the return of King Jesus. Second, there's the resurrection of the dead. Third, there's the rapture of the living. Notice the word then. Notice the word first at the end of verse 16, the word then at the beginning of verse 17. He's giving us an order. The word rapture is not a Bible word. In fact, the word rapture never occurs in the Bible. But the idea occurs in the Bible right here in particular. He says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Let me stop right there for just a moment. That describes the rapture of the living. What happens to those believers who are alive when Jesus returns? They're raptured. They're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And notice who else they're meeting in the air. They're meeting their loved ones who have already died and have been in God's presence, only they will have a resurrected, glorified body. I think maybe my mom's death hit me so hard because my mom, my mom had only been a Christian, I mean, literally a very, very short time. In fact, it wasn't until the last time we were sitting together on the front porch in Ashland, Kentucky, that she actually was able to describe for me a very recent conversion experience. For over 30 years, Jaylen and I had prayed for her. For over 30 years, I had shared with her. For over 30 years, she would get very frustrated with me for sharing with her. Because she would say, I'm a Methodist, you're a Baptist, we Methodists don't believe that. I say, Mom, you don't know that John Wesley was a Methodist, and John Wesley believed exactly what I'm telling you. Well, I don't know about John Wesley, but at our church, we don't believe that. Well, she never went to church. My mom never went to church. And so, on that day when I, we were getting ready to leave Ashland and come back to Louisville and we're on the front porch and, and I talked with her about, Mama, could we, talk about, uh, could we talk about what it means to be a Christian? And she said, yes, I would like that. Well, that's the first time she had ever said that. Can I share with you how I became a Christian? I'd like to hear that. 
And then I said, Mom, what about you? Would you like to give your life to Christ? She said, I think I've already done that. And I said, well, Mom, when did you do that? She said, not very long ago, just before I came back from Florida. I was watching Pastor David at a Baptist church on television. And he was talking about things just the way that you did. And I thought, well, you know, Pastor David believes that my son believes that that must be right. And she began to listen to him week in and week out, and she gave her life to Christ. Notice there's going to be the return of King Jesus. There's going to be the resurrection of the dead. There's going to be the rapture of the living, and there's going to be the reunion of the saints. Notice he says, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds And as wonderful and magnificent and spectacular and as glorious as it will be to encounter our loved ones, we will meet the Lord in the air. That will transcend any other reunion that we might ever have. Because up to this point in life, we've been walking by faith and not by sight. We we believe in Him and we love Him, though we've never seen Him. And on that particular day, whether it's by first by death or by rapture, we will meet the Lord and see Him face to face. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. A lot of the gibberish you hear at funerals are nothing more than gibberish. But the Bible tells us for those in Christ Jesus, there's genuine hope. There's hope of reunion but we have ourselves to have believed in that gospel of a crucified and risen Savior. I'm going to ask you if you'll stand and let me lead us in a word of prayer. If you'll bow your heads for just a moment, maybe you take just a moment and ask yourself, and it's something that it's healthy to do from time to time, no matter how many years we, we've walked with Jesus, It's helpful for some from time to time to ask, do I genuinely know Jesus? Do I have the marks of being born again by the Spirit of God? Not do you live a perfect life, because I tell you, I sure don't. And not that you are always what you want to be, That's your yearning. That's your desire. Father, we thank you that while death is our most formidable foe in one sense, we thank you that you've taken away the sting of death for the believer. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as we grieve, we would grieve as those who have hope, not as those who are hopeless. In Jesus' name, amen.